Thanks very much. Um, uh, it seems the perfect time to have a discussion about civility in the public square, given that nationally we're having an incredibly civil dialogue uh, <laughs> about politics, uh, you know. Um, but I do think that at this time, uh, I tip my hat to Redeemer for, I think, trying to not only uh, hold this conversation, but also hold all of our own feet to the fire and try to model behavior that, that really is needed. So I salute you for that. Um, I do want to say that, you know, I think there's a natural tendency to think, oh, you know, this is all the fault of Twitter or the Internet uh, or today's candidates. Um, but... Actually, I think incivility has roots that go back about as far as democracy itself. And I wasn't um, quite reporting then, but apparently in ancient Athens, um, there, uh, you know, people were making the most vile insults uh, about each other. And certainly in the early part of American history, as you probably know, uh, the election of 1800 between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams was renowned for its viciousness. Uh, it makes... Um, 2016 even perhaps seem a little bit tame. I was, uh, I was just looking up uh, some of the uh, statements from 1800, and, um, you know, uh, Jefferson's uh, camp uh, accused uh, John Adams of having a hideous her hermaphroditical character. <laughs> uh, well, Adams' uh, people in turn said that Jefferson was a mean-spirited, low-lived fellow, the son of a half-breed Indian squaw, sired by a Virginia mulatto farm father. Adams' uh, folks said that Jefferson uh, was in favor of teaching murder, rape, adultery, and incest in schools. <laughs> um, but Jefferson eventually uh, triumphed by essentially hiring a dirty tricks team, which went around trying to convince people, and to some degree successfully, that uh, if elected, Adams would start a war with France. And um, so <laughs> this kind of incivility has deep roots, and you can look through American history and you see echoes of it uh, over and over. And I think in part, this has to do with kind of who we are and some natural human tendencies. Um, in uh, evolutionary biologists say that there's a, a, a human tendency to almost instantaneously, even with young children, determine whether somebody is essentially my team or the other team, my tribe or the other team, my, my guy or the other guy. And uh, so we take various shortcuts to figure that out. Maybe it's race, uh, maybe it's uh, clothing, whatever it may be, but we make these decisions. And I do think that a lot of our problems with incivility have to do with this tendency to otherize, if you will, to otherize people based on race or religion, uh, national origin, uh, the way they look, um, uh, maybe uh, uh, immigration status. Uh, and that once we've otherized people, it becomes very easy then to form invidious conclusions about them, to make uh, insulting comments about them, and to dehumanize them. And uh, one of the problems, I think, has been that on top of all these other ways in which we otherize people, we're also otherizing people now based on, on, on politics uh, and, uh, and, and on identity. And we're sorting ourselves out as a country so that we're less likely to know and have friends and be neighbors of people who have very different views or are different. Um, uh, today, about half of the uh, counties in the country are going to... Uh, vote in a landslide for either Clinton or Trump, about half of the counties. Uh, back in 1976, it was 20%. Um, and so we're much more likely to be surrounded by people who are like-minded, who are at a similar socioeconomic level, who kind of think like us. Um, for Clinton supporters, it's perhaps quite likely that you don't know 
a lot of Trump supporters maybe don't know a Trump supporter. For Trump supporters, it may well be that you don't know any Clinton supporters, or not very many. And in that context, I do think it becomes really easy to, um, to otherize. And we also know there's some, some evidence that when we're surrounded by like-minded people, we become even more so. Uh, Cass Sunstein uh, at Harvard did a really interesting study of judges and how they ruled, and he found that when liberal judges were impaneled with other liberal judges, they became more liberal. And when conservative judges were impaneled with other conservative judges, they in turn became more conservative. And essentially, we've done, and that, you know, these are incredibly smart, well-trained people. And as a country, I think, we've gone through a similar process. We are impaneled, if you will, with people who are increasingly like us. And uh, I think that tends to compound whatever our own views are. Um, and then there's the media world, um, my, own, you know, my own domain. In contrast to Europe, uh, the American news media evolved um, essentially along principles of wire services. And wire services wanted to have subscribers in Democratic newspapers and in Republican papers. So, they, the, so the principle was you'd write down the middle so that uh, you'd have a bigger market, so that by both uh, liberal and conservative uh, papers would, uh, would subscribe to you. And so in contrast to Europe, where you tended to have socialist newspapers and conservative newspapers, you didn't, you didn't tend to have that so much in this country. Um, well, that has changed. And increasingly, everybody has figured out that there is a real market for liberal news or conservative news. And abundant evidence of selection bias that we tend to want news that isn't going to question our prejudices, but is going to confirm our prejudices. And uh, this is, again, I think, a natural human trait that the internet and uh, TV can now cater to. Um, and it's not just a matter of conservatives watching Fox and liberals watching MSNBC, but I think more broadly now you're getting these various alternative um, news, in air quotes, sites, uh, that, that really present um, incredibly scurrilous information that um, denigrates people, that is often racist, uh, that is really incredibly vicious. Um, the uh, BuzzFeed did a fantastic article a few days ago, which I commend to you if you haven't seen it, where they looked at a week's worth of articles uh, on alt-right, alt-left sites, and, and on uh, mainstream sites. And uh, what they found was that 20% uh, of the um, news, so to speak, on the, um, uh, the, the liberal uh, sites was completely, completely fake, really didn't have any, any much basis in reality. 40% uh, of the news on the uh, alt-right sites was that way too. And I must say it often had a, had a real racial uh, or racist element to it. Uh, it's really worth checking out some of these sites if you haven't done it. Um, and like the Daily Eagle, uh, for example, which I just discovered this weekend, and is really depressing to look at. Um, <laughs> you're much better off with the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the upshot is um, there was a, a, a scholar at MIT, uh, Nicholas Negroponte, who wrote years ago about the dangers of developing a media product uh, called the Daily Me. And that's kind of what we've developed. We all have our own daily me that we absorb and get. And um, I think it both reinforces our prejudices and makes it easier to, um, to dehumanize and condemn people uh, who think differently. And so in that context, let me talk a little bit about faith and religion, which I think has also played a role in all of this. Um, in, I think, beginning, you know, I, it seems to me it dates back to the 1970s. And 
I'll probably offend just about everybody on every possible <laughs> point of view, so, uh, but um, journalists are good at doing that. Uh, you know, I think that part of this was when the, uh, the, the, the moral majority or the um, uh, conservative evangelicals began to focus on uh, some of the values issues and uh, 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 gays in particular. And I've got to say that uh, I think that left a bitter taste in, uh, I think they were on the wrong side of history there. Uh, and as somebody who covered AIDS in particular, I found it completely outrageous to have uh, people who should be providing helping hands instead pointing fingers. Um, in the words of Anita Bryant, referring to gays as human garbage. And, um, and saying that uh, AIDS was sent by God to, to punish gays uh, in ways that impeded a public health response to HIV AIDS. Um, and I think that that resulted, um, I think that hugely damaged how conservative evangelicals, and to some extent all evangelicals, were perceived by the liberal end of the perspective, uh, of the, of the, and the more secular end of the chain. And I think that in turn, uh, liberals became, um, if you will, intolerant of, um, uh, of, of, cons of Christians and especially evangelicals. So you had, it seems to me, a certain amount of religious intolerance that has become matched more recently by irreligious intolerance. And both, to some degree, are ongoing. And I find this so frustrating because on so many of the issues that I care deeply about, I see secular groups doing fantastic work. And I see religious groups doing superb work. And yet, because of this God gulf, because of this distrust, because they just think the worst of the other, they don't cooperate. And when they don't cooperate, then the winners are poverty and illiteracy, disease. Um, and on some occasions, there, people have been willing to try to bridge that gap and, and trust and become a little more civil in their cooperation. And there, the results have been sometimes very successful. I think a model of that has been um, human trafficking. In, 2000, in the year 2000, there was a, uh, a real effort to build a coalition between secular feminists and um, conservative evangelicals. And uh, the result was the uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Act and subsequent legislation that really transformed how we see human trafficking worldwide and more recently at home. Um, but that model hasn't been followed in other areas. And even there, I must say, it's very tenuous. And the, uh, the fact that there isn't greater cooperation, I think, has, um, has really undermined things that both sides care deeply about. So how do we... You know, how do we build bridges and, um, and move beyond this? Maybe especially about issues that you know, we care really, really deeply about. Um, if, for liberals, it's, um, it may be, you know, gay rights, or it may be, um, uh, you know, a sense that the nation's social fabric is at stake, or racism, whatever else, for Many conservatives, it's, um, it's abortion and perception that human lives are at stake. I guess I would say that our natural impulse is often to respond to what we see as illiberal attacks or intolerance with intolerance of our own. And that putting aside everything else, I don't think it's terribly effective at changing minds. What does seem to be more effective, and there's some social psychology work on this, is to humanize the issue, 
and frame it in very individual human terms. And that's how you build empathy and build compassion and can be begin to create some of that response. I also think that when you have people actually talking to each other and seeing each other, then it becomes um, a lot harder to disdain people, to dehumanize them, to dismiss them. As a reporter, if I'm going to write, if I'm going to denounce somebody in my column, then I will typically give them a call and say, by the way, secretary so-and-so, my <laughs> column tomorrow is going to take a whack at you. <laughs> and it, it forces you to, to be a little bit more careful, to understand that at the other end of the, of the phone, there is a real person who probably believes deeply in their positions, can understand how you can be so wrong, and it tempers my columns just a little bit. Um, and probably makes them less readable. <laughs> but it, I think that that instinct of actually engaging real people who one disagrees with is, uh, is really important. And it may be harder to do that um, actually physically meeting people, um, but one can do it at an intellectual level. You know, every, every day or pretty much every day I go, uh, I go running or I, I work out um, because even though it's painful, it, I feel like it makes me a better person. And every day for the same reason, I read the Wall Street Journal editorial page. <laughs> <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> um, but it, <laughs> it does build muscles. It makes me understand different perspectives. Um, and I do <laughs> commend, you know, that approach. When I travel, I always uh, put the TV onto Fox News, uh, kind of understand what I'm, what I'm missing. Um, <laughs> reinforces my decision at home to put it on CNN. But <laughs> um, and you know, the, I don't think that this has to force any of us to retreat from issues and ideas that we care very, very deeply about. Um, I'm sure you know the Yates uh, line, um, the, uh, the, the, I'm forgetting now, the best are full, no, uh, the worst are full of passion. Uh, when, what is the, what are the best? The best are full, the best are, the best lack all conviction, the worst are full of passion intensity. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One hand, if you're ever giving a talk and you're about to summon a quote, make sure you actually have it up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that is a problem, that often the best are wavering, are uncertain, have a humility about their convictions, while the worst lack that humility and are more likely to rush into judgment. Um, but... I do think that one can have some humility about one's views. And uh, I'm, Sir Isaiah Berlin is my, the philosopher maybe that I admire uh, the most. And he, he wrote about how it is possible to acknowledge, to realize that you may be wrong, that it's a complicated world, that there may be other factors or other things that will change, that not everything you believe in is going to be an eternal truth, and yet to believe in it and to act on it because it is the best information you have. And where there are issues of refugees or of genocide or racism that I cover, I realize that I may not have full information, that I may get it wrong, but it still seems to me incumbent upon one to try to mitigate those wrongs as one perceives them, and yet to try to do that in a way that acknowledges the humanity uh, and autonomy of those with whom we disagree. Thanks very much for having me here. I'm looking forward to the conversation afterward. <laughs> <laughs>